Good evening and welcome to the 2012 Shakopee State Legislative Debate on the campus of Shakopee High School. My name is Rob O'Neill. I'm the pastor of Brookwood Community Church and I'll be moderating tonight's forum. <coughs> the Shakopee Chamber and Visitors Bureau is sponsoring this event in partnership with Shakopee Public Schools. Students from Shakopee Public Schools are here in the lecture hall tonight and several of them will be assisting me in asking questions of the candidates. The views expressed in tonight's debate are those of the candidates, not those of the Chamber and Visitors Bureau or of Shakopee Public Schools. Candidates will be asked a series of questions and they'll have one minute to respond. If I ask a follow-up question, candidates will be given 30 seconds to respond to the follow-up and candidates will also have the option of using a 30 second rebuttal. We'll begin with the candidates for House District 55A. In alphabetical order, we welcome Representative Mike Beard and Mr. Chuck Berg. Candidates, you will have one minute for your opening statements and we'll begin with Mr. Beard. And now we welcome our candidates for Senate District 55, Ms. Kathy Bush and Mr. Eric Pratt. Candidates, let me just remind you that you'll have one minute to respond to each question. If there's a follow-up question, you'll be given 30 seconds for your follow-up answer. You may also choose to use 30 seconds for a rebuttal. We'll begin with opening statements and we'll begin with Ms. Bush. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for your attendance tonight. I'm, I'm absolutely amazed at how many people are here. It's a very good sign for our communities. Um, I have uh, been a community member here for most of my life. And uh, I am so appreciative of having had the opportunity to grow up in this area as well as to make the, I'm glad I made the decision to come back and raise my family here. Um, I just completed 20 years on the Shakopee School Board and I have um, additionally worked as a small business owner in real estate. I've been a teacher, I've worked in a nonprofit, been a grant writer. I believe that broad range of experiences has prepared me to work with people with differing views, with similar views, to get the job done. Um, you may ask, why am I running? I haven't been in political you know, office or a position before, but I've been encouraged by people like yourself to, to do this, that I'm the right person to get along with others and stop the gridlock. Mr. Pratt. Hi, my name's Eric Pratt, and uh, for those of you that don't know me, um, I've lived in Scott County for about 35 years. My family moved here when I was in junior high. Uh, my family, my wife Tina and I have been married for 21 years. We have two wonderful children, uh, Cameron, who's a senior in high school, and Samantha, who's a, a sophomore. Uh, most, of, uh, most of my married time, uh, the last 18 years, we've lived in Scott County uh, and made it our home. It's been a great place to raise a family. Boy, our bios sound extremely similar. Uh, I've been on Prior Lake School Board for the last 12 years. Uh, I was passionate about education. My mom taught school here in Shakopee uh, for over 20 years. She taught sixth grade at, at a number of the schools. Um, I've been in, uh, uh, I have a degree in economics and a master's in finance. And I think those are two skills that our state needs desperately. But what our state really needs desperately is strong leadership. Uh, when I joined the Prior Lake School Board, we were facing a million dollar deficit. Today we're financially sound. And so those are the tough decisions that we made. We made tough decisions, we prioritized our, our uh, actions, and we, uh, our students are doing very well. So I'd like to thank the Chamber and uh, Shakopee Schools. Our first question for you candidates this evening is going to be in the field of education. And we'll begin with Mr. Pratt. Do you have plans to address teacher accountability in education? Um, I think we do need accountability in teaching. Uh, it's, it's a difficult one and, and the last debate talked about uh, all, the, uh, all the roadblocks or the, or the hurdles that, that face it. But the fact of the matter is, is that every business in the state faces accountability, faces uh, a review. And we have to have a way to measure how well our, stu our teachers are doing, how well our students are doing. I honestly believe we're over testing our students today. And an account a, a system of accountability shouldn't be solely based on test scores. But it should also be based on some subjective uh, criteria like classroom management, um, how well students are growing in their classrooms. And so building a well-rounded evaluation system that's not only that that's not focused on punitive actions but really about developing teachers to be their 
uh, to be their best, much like annual evaluations in the business world are done to get employees to be their best. Thank you. Ms. Bush, do you have plans to address teacher accountability in education? Well, it's my belief that teachers are probably the most critical component in a child's education, and we all know how important education is for those children's futures as well as for, our, as a society, our futures. Um, I was a teacher. I hope I was an accountable teacher. Um, but I think that something that we can do is to increase at our administrative level. Level, And I know that that's going to sound strange, and that's something that I know as a former school board member is not a popular decision to make. But you would not find in the business world uh, a ratio of administrators or supervisors to um, teachers or other staff that you find in education. It's, it's unbelievable. I think that we need to be very, very careful in who we hire. And that starts with hiring good administrators who then um, have the time and ability to hire very good teachers who then go through a good evaluation system as well as coaching and mentoring their first few years. Quick. Mr. Pratt. Um, I, I would just take a little bit different tact on that to say that I believe rather than building up the administrative ranks, and I agree, uh, we ask our administrative staff today to do way too much for the resources we give them. However, in Prior Lake Savage, we have a great mentoring system that helps these young teachers, I would like to see us be able to create uh, something that utilizes the staff that we have. Teachers know who good teachers are. Teachers can train good teachers and mentor them in, in a way that will help them be better performers without bloating the administrative budget. So I might take a different tack uh, than Kathy to say that I would rather see some alternative way than just increasing administration. And I would um, agree with you, Eric, about um, coaches or mentors or, or people that can help those teachers, I would look at them as administrators as well. So that's part of the increase that I was talking about. For our second question, we're going to move to a, the subject of the budget. And this question is going to come to us from a Shakopee High School student, Sean Bowerman. Sean's going to ask our question number two on budget. What new efficiencies, quality improvements, or cuts in programming could make government more effective? For this question, we'll begin with Ms. Bush. Well, I think it, in an ongoing way, the legislatures, legislative people need to be looking at the budget every year and looking at it with a fine-tooth comb. There is no way that we can sustain what we have been doing. Um, there's so many needs and so many wants, but I think uh, we ne need to learn to say no to certain things. Now, um, there are certainly things that can be done at a local level. Um, for us, as residents in an area like this, if things are shifted to a local level, we still pay for it. So it's, it's you know, we can say we've reduced our state budget, but we'll still pay for it. Um, but I think everything needs to be looked at very carefully. Um, if I, if I would be elected to the legislature, I think that has to be the number one priority, is we need to just have a lot of oversight of our budget. Mr. Pratt, what efficiencies, quality improvements, or cuts in program could make government more effective? You know, I think one of the things that can make government more effective, and, and I'll say responsive, responsive to the people because we're servants of the people, is to have decisions made at the local level. Uh, as a school board member trying to cut our budget uh, and make the right decisions for our community, we face state mandate after state mandate that hampered our ability to do that. I know how to serve my community. Shakopee City Council, Shakopee School Board knows how to, how, to, how to serve their community best rather than state mandates. And so we have redundancy built into the system that if you're talking about efficiency, moving those decisions moving those funding uh, decisions down to the local level and taking them off the state books. Well, reforming our system for collecting taxes is a major topic at every level in this year's election. Do you believe that there are fundamental inequities in our current tax system? And if so, what would they be? Mr. Pratt, we'll begin with you. Oh, I absolutely think there are fundamental inequities in our tax system. Uh, we're trying to grow an economy and we're hampering small business and business in general with uh, some owner's property taxes. As I've talked to, as, as I've talked to business people, they, they look at me and they say, it's killing them. Um, they have to pay the property taxes before they increase their inventory, before they expand their business, before they hire a new employee. 
uh, and, and the property tax comes whether they make a profit or not. So I think there's one inequity that if we want to really grow our economy and we really want people to invest in Minnesota, we have to make it attractive for them to invest. And then I think um, we've got uh, regressive taxes uh, that uh, need to be addressed. The governor wants to raise uh, income taxes on the wealthy, and yet it's not income taxes that are creating the tax disparity. It's the, proper, it's the household property taxes and the sales tax. So I think we need overall tax reform looking at how we do it uh, and, and re-engineer re the entire system. Ms. Bush, same question to you. Do you believe there are fundamental inequities in our current tax system? And if so, what? Yeah, I do believe there are. And um, I do support the governor's proposal to raise taxes on the wealthiest 2% of our population. Um, I also am a supporter of sales tax. Um, I think that that's equitable and also um, property tax. Although I do understand how it hurts businesses with um, property taxes. And I think that when we want to attract businesses to our area and we want to create jobs through, those, through the business growth, that we maybe can provide incentives to those businesses. And one of those could be um, to not have as high a property tax for a period of time while they get their business going. Well, just as a follow-up to this, do you believe that there are Minnesotans who are not paying their fair share of taxes? Who are they and are they paying perhaps too little or too much. Mr. Pratt, you've talked about some of those. Are there others? Um, I don't know that anybody's not paying their fair share of taxes. In fact, I think we probably have some people who are paying more than their fair share uh, when you look at the government services consumed versus uh, what they pay. But uh, if we were to look at some sort of tax reform that uh, flattened the uh, income tax rates, reduced sales taxes, reduced business property taxes in such a way that those regressive taxes weren't hurting the low income and middle income families uh, that we heard about that we hear about. Uh, I think that's a more fair system. To say that one group is not paying their fair share over another, I don't think is the is the question. It's whether or not we have a fair system to start with. Ms. Bush, do you believe there are Minnesotans who are not paying their fair share of taxes and who are they and are they paying too little or too much? Well, I believe most people would say they, they pay their fair share. Most, most people would believe that. Um, but as I said earlier, I believe that the wealthiest 2% of our state can pay more. They, they have more expendable income, and I think there needs to be a change at that level. Just to give both of you an opportunity to clarify your opponent's position, what do you find to be wrong with your <laughs> opponent's plan for modifying taxes? <laughs> She gets to go first, right? <laughs> it, this is still a follow-up to the okay. same question. You're still on deck. I, I disagree with raising the income taxes on the on the two percent on the wealthiest two percent. The wealthiest two percent are small business people and sub S corporations whose sales count towards their towards their income and revenue. Um, the wealthiest two percent are some of the people who create jobs in this state. What we're not. It's not fair to charge one group more. It's fair to create a system. Uh, that equalizes the burden across the board, um, not to pick on, on uh, different classes of, of income and say that it's, it's right and just to, to take their personal property. Ms. Bush? Well, most of us are middle income, middle class people, and um, I think that we are paying more than our fair share to support this state and our local services. Um, I, I would stay with my perspective on this, and uh, I, I do believe that sales tax also is a help um, to our society. I would like to see that expanded to include some online taxes or taxes for online purchases. I think that's something that we've lost in our state. So many of us are purchasing things today online rather than, you know, than at a, a business in, in our state, and um, so that's another place. Mr. Pratt, a Well, response. I'll take a moment to agree with Kathy on one on item in that we do need to charge sales tax on, on online purchases. Um, we need to allow our brick and mortar uh, retailers and businesses to compete with the online world and not be showcases. Um, but again, when you start talking about sales taxes, it's the low and middle income people, when you look at the Department of Revenue's report, that are being hurt most by those regressive taxes. And so, if I, I truly want to help the middle class as well, I believe taking those regressive taxes off of their uh, burden is, is what we need to do. 
Our next question, we're going to move to the subject of energy, and this is going to be asked by a student from West Junior High School here in Shakopee, Devangi Bora. Devangi's question will go first to Ms. Bush. What do you see as the ideal mix of um, energy sources for Minnesota? Well, I think we always need to um, be looking to the future with this, and we have to probably lower our reliance on those types of energy sources that are not renewable. Um, on oil and uh, gas and, and do what we can to um, investigate the greater use of water and solar and possibly wind, although I know that things have been done with wind resources and I don't know that we're having the success that was maybe at first hoped for, but um, I would like to see um, a variety of types of energy sources used and we always need to be paying particular attention to how those uh, types of energy uh, energy uses are affecting our environment and then in turn the um, health for you know and our well-being as a result of what uh, may be in the air or in our water. Mr. Pratt? This is a difficult question for me because I don't real I don't believe it's government's uh, role to determine what the right mix of energy uses are. I think we need to rely on businesses uh, and and uh, our, our power providers to determine what that is. I was out at uh, Dick Sanitation in Lakeville. They just invested two million dollars in natural gas, converting many of their trucks over to natural gas. It's quieter, it's cleaner. They didn't, it wasn't a mandate that forced them to do it. It was a good business choice. We've been investing in ethanol for 10 years. At some point in time, we need to say that that industry needs to stand on its own. And so I look to the, I look to the uh, marketplace to say what the right mix of business is. But what we do need to do in order to grow our economy is make sure that we do have affordable sources of energy that will fuel the growth uh, in the next, in the next uh, decade. We'll move now to social issues that are very divisive in our state right now, and we'll begin by asking you, do you support the proposed voter ID amendment and why? And Mr. Pratt, we'll begin with you. Oh, I love this question. Uh, I do support voter ID. I think, it's, uh, I think it's a reasonable accommodation to ensure that our elections are credible. And I th it, elections and voting are the, ground, are, are the groundwork that our system is built on, and we need to make sure that those uh, uh, votes cast are credible votes and that they're not being Ill they're not being diluted by illegitimate votes um, I've worked in fraud I've worked in fraud prevention I've kept people from uh, becoming victims of identity theft and I can tell you that unless you pr it's hard to find it on the back end you have to prevent it up front and I think asking to provide a, an ID at point of registration is a reasonable accommodation Ms. Bush um, I absolutely do not support this amendment. Um, I think the legislature didn't do their work in, in getting this vetted out. It's um, being sent to us to determine what should be done, but we don't really know what the cost would be if this would be put in place. Um, we don't know how people would get these IDs. I think it would definitely hurt um, a certain segment of our population that would include senior citizens, possibly people in the service or veterans, our young people that are at colleges. Um, I, it has not been shown to me that we have a voter fraud issue in this state. Minnesota has one of the highest levels of voter turnout in our country. Um, I think we, we do our due diligence in this state. And uh, I, I'm not so naive to, as to think that there might not be some voter fraud, but from what I've read, I believe it might be with felons and the voter ID um, requirement may not solve that problem. Well, staying on social issues for just a moment, what is your point of view on the marriage amendment and why? We'll begin with Ms. Bush. Well, I also am opposed to this amendment. Um, I think we have a law in place already, um, as Mr. Berg said in the first part of the debate tonight. Um, I believe that amendments to our constitution or to our state, whether it's state or national, um, should expand our rights, not, not um, limit our rights. Um, I don't feel that I'm a person that should say what's right for other people. 
Um, churches who have said this is wrong, um, the churches don't have to do anything to follow this. They, they still can do what they would like to do, but I am not about limiting rights. If I think about it, our um, national constitution has only 27 amendments. 10 of those are the Bill of Rights. So there's 17 other amendments, and Minnesota is looking at adding two amendments possibly this year. Um, that doesn't seem right to me. Um, and in general, I'm not in favor of amendments out to the voters. Mr. Pratt. Well, I, I am uh, supporting the amendment. Um, Mr. Mr. Uh, Beard so eloquently gave us the history and of the family unit and how important it is to our society. But I'd rather talk about it from uh, a, a different perspective in that right now we have a court case that's going through, going through the state legal system where, th where three uh, uh, couples, same-sex couples, are challenging the current defense of marriage uh, legislation. And I agree with Mr. Beard and I agree with, with last year's legislature that it should be for the people to decide what the definition of marriage is. It's derived, it's derived from holy matrimony and we need to be able to put that to the voters. Now, I think it, what, what I don't want to have happen is churches feel threatened and forced to go against their creed and be sued because they refuse to uh, uh, perform or uh, a same-sex marriage or uh, lease their, their facilities to uh, couples that, that they don't uh, agree with. Our next question will come from the transportation issue. And we'd like to know, Twin Cities residents frequently cite traffic congestion as a major concern. What should be done to address this concern Mr. Pratt. Uh, first and foremost, we need more roads, and we need better roads. Um, we've got a 101 bridge that floods every few years that congests the system. We need to make that, we need to raise that bridge out of the floodplain, and we need to make it a, a, a four-lane uh, bridge. And Senator Roebling and, and Representative Beard have done a great job of carrying that uh, through the legislature. Um, I'm not in favor of light rail. I'm, in, I'm more in favor of buses. Buses are flexible. Buses go where people go. Rails are there, and they're there for 100 years. And so uh, I believe that we need to have a system that's flexible. I look at this area 30 years ago, and, had we, and, and we would have never put train tracks here. I don't know what it's going to look like 30 years from now. Ms. Bush? Um, when, I, when going out into the community and doing door knocking or meeting with people over the last few months, um, other than the gridlock um, in St. Paul, this is probably the number one thing I've heard about. Um, people in this area who commute, which is about, I think only 25% of the people who live in Scott County work in Scott County, so let's say 75% of the people are commuting. They're frustrated with the amount of time it takes and the difficulty of getting to where they work. 40% of the people in Scott County, I think if they're in Hennepin County, are trying to get across the river. Um, we've, we've seen some nice improvements um, starting in 1995 with the 169 freeway and bridge, but we've outgrown that. We need to do some things to um, allow people to move more freely on the roads. Um, so I think one solution that was a temporary solution with the increased lanes, the striping is good. I also um, am a supporter of public transportation and as Mr. Pratt said, he preferred buses and I feel the same. I think we can look at light rail but certainly um, more transit stations. And I applaud um, the local area for building more transit stations. Well, Minnesota has also seen a major interstate highway bridge collapse. We asked the House candidates, is the state doing enough to keep up with the wear and tear on our transportation system? But we'd like to expand that question for you all and ask you, do you believe we're making an adequate investment in our infrastructure as a state? Ms. Bush, we'll begin with you. I don't know that I'm really qualified to answer that in, you know, in, a, in a good educated way. Um, I believe that our state has paid more attention to this issue since the bridge collapse. Um, people, it's on people's radar a little bit more. Um, but it would certainly be a priority of mine if I would be elected that we do look at our infrastructure. Um, it, it's so critical. I think um, a couple of the things that are most important for us to look at are education and our infrastructure. So that would be something that I would spend time looking at. Be a priority. Mr. Pratt, do you believe we're making an adequate investment in infrastructure? 
I don't I don't know right now whether the the investment is adequate I know it's better than it used to be um, the 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 idea is that making sure we prioritize the infrastructure so that it has the greatest benefit to commuters and to uh, the economic growth and looking at the options I loved what mr. Beard said in that safety comes first and at midnight safety is first those folks are experts they know where they know where our, our, our primary areas are it's not just about commuters going across the river I do it every day um, it's about moving goods and services it's about creating a system that allows commerce to to occur freely because we're only choked in, in commuting for a couple hours a day um, I want to make sure that we we uh, were constitutionally mandated that gas tax and vehicle tabs go to roads and bridges and I want to make sure that every dime of the transportation amendment uh, that that 60 percent uh, goes to roads and bridges as well so that we can expand our capacity we'll switch for just a few moments then to the environment what is your view of frac sand mining mr. Pratt boy um, you know I'm not a I'm not a frac sand expert but I do know that frac sand is used for a number of different uh, 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 uses whether it's um, for drilling whether it's for making glass uh, whether it's for filtering water in, in uh, pool systems and, and other water filters uh, it's an important economic driver in this community because we have it here and we have the rules and regulations in place to assure that it's done safely but uh, in the end I think that's a decision that's left best left for the county boards to decide and that goes to the local control that I'm so passionate about Ms. Bush right um, in some areas of our state of our state we've had um, some difficulty with having um, the frac mining be accepted by the local communities but I know that in this area we have an operation now outside of Shakopee between Shakopee and Jordan that really um, I heard very little about until I decided to investigate this issue um, and in talking with people um, about this I, I have learned that that went through you know the environmental impact study with the county and the city and um, I think they met met the standards um, the thing that's different about the local business that's doing this mining is that they're using rail to um, move the sand after it's mined and it's not um, creating the truck traffic and and the disruption to our local communities that we're seeing in some other places I think it's important for the economy it's important for use in places like North Dakota where a lot of people have gone for jobs where we have a real great uh, business with uh, the oil fields now and uh, so I think it's it's important to be able to do that and um, if we don't impact people locally so that um, there's too much traffic or there's these sand clouds then I, I'm all in favor of it well to continue on the topic of the environment for just another minute how would you change our current regulatory processes for protecting our environment Ms. Bush how would how would they be changed how would you change our current regulatory practices for protecting our environment hmm. well I, it's just so important to protect our environment I think it's important for our long our health and our um, long-range well-being um, this is one place where we we do need government oversight um, and I think it is a, a duty of the state to to do that um, I believe we have regular regulatory um, procedures in place and and I'm not certain how they would need to be changed but I would be in favor of continuing regulatory procedures mr. Pratt how would you change our current regulatory processes for protecting our environment I don't have any that I've identified that I'd want to change but I think uh, I'll take a similar uh, uh, idea that Kathy had in that the role of the regulatory is to make sure that we have a level playing field that we don't have people who are cheating the system and that everybody plays by the fair by fair rules but the fact of the matter is is the environment's everybody's concern we have farmers that care about their soil and about their water quality we have hunter and fishermen who care that to make sure that we have the natural resources in the clean air in order to be in order to keep this state uh, among the top in, in uh, sportsman outdoor sportsmanship um, the role of the government is not to create rules and duplicity that continues to, to build upon uh, different layers. It's to make sure that we uh, set the guidelines, set the rules of the fair playing field, and let local, local governments execute. 
Well, let's shift for a few minutes to the topic of politics. There's a perception that both political parties have become more polarized in their positions in recent years. First of all, is this true of your party? And we'll begin with Mr. Pratt. <laughs> I think it's fair mm -hmm. both parties. Um, uh, of course, it's it's become polarized. We, you know, and and we as a nation have become more polarized. Um, everybody d dislikes Congress, but they love their congressman um, because they vote the way that they want him to or her. Um, I think what I bring to the state is is a history and experience of of working uh, in a nonpartisan fashion. Uh, I was the first board chair to meet one on one with our union president in Prior Lake Savage. We didn't agree on everything, but we started talking. We found areas of agreement that we could work on. And, in, and, and from those conversations, we finished our teacher's contract earlier than we ever had. We started moving on some initiatives for staff morale, and we uh, corrected uh, a, a calendar issue that, was, uh, that benefited both families and teachers. That didn't happen by partisanship. That happened by working together. We fixed our million dollar budget deficit by working together with teachers and administrators and each other with different views to make sure that we could work through it. Uh, it takes, you know, it takes a little give and take, um, but that's how, that's how you move forward. Ms. Bush, there's a perception that both political parties have become more polarized in their positions in recent years. Is this true of your party? <laughs> Of course, it's true of both parties, and it's, I think, more than a perception. I think there really is polarization in St. Paul and, and in Congress, and um, I think that's the number one thing that needs to change right now in our legislature, and this may be a good opportunity this year for things to begin to change because, unfortunately, uh, so many people who were in our legislature decided not to run again. Uh, I think it be, there just was too much gridlock. It became too frustrating for people, and the public was frustrated. Um, I attended a, a candidate training in June, an all-day training, and what I heard from every one of the 24 candidates that attended was the number one thing they wanted to do was to work across the aisle to get rid of the gridlock and to start getting things moving again in Minnesota. Um, my experience and background in being on the school board here in Shakopee for 20 years was that I was in an a nonpartisan position, that's how I'm accustomed to operating. I believe I can work well with all people and I would be committed to not playing the partisan game if I were elected to go to St. Paul. We'd like to move back to the budget for just a few moments. Balancing a budget requires that revenue and spending be roughly equal. Would you balance a budget by increasing revenue, decreasing expenditures, or a mixture of both? And please explain for us. Ms. Bush, we'll begin with you. Um, my approach would be a mixture of both. I'm not going to stand here tonight and say that I would never raise taxes. I would never make that no taxes pledge because until you're in the situation, you don't know what you're going to need to do. Um, but I do believe that the budget needs to be scrutinized. Um, you need to look for ways to cut wasteful spending, um, then prioritize, um, look at different sources of revenue, and um, have a blend. I, I, I uh, think that we uh, just have not, not been diligent enough in St. Paul about getting rid of things that maybe are no longer things that we should be spending money on. Um, that's the way that we often operate as families. That's the way we operated as a school district here. Um, things, things need to change. And so I think there needs to be a mix. Mr. Pratt, do you balance the budget by increasing revenue, decreasing expenditures, or a mixture of both? Well, I'll talk about uh, the situation as I see it today, and I think uh, we, we have enough tax revenue. We have a $35 billion budget that has grown faster than the general economy. Um, I agree, we have to have a balanced budget. That's what we expect families to do, but family can't go out and raise revenue uh, when they face hard times. They have to cut their spending. They have to prioritize their needs and wants. That's the position that I take. We're among the highest tax states in the nation already. so. We just need to sit down and, and really prioritize what's important. We talked about $2 billion that we owe uh, the, the, uh, the schools. We have to make that a priority. We talked about funding transportation. We have to make that a priority. But we have to determine what our priorities are, start with those, and then move forward. Ms. Bush? I would just like to respond. I think the other thing that's important for um, any entity that's looking at a budget to 
really focus on is creating a reserve or a fund balance. There are going to be times when things change, like when our economy um, we got to the point where people weren't working. You know, we had so many more people out of work. We weren't, we weren't generating the revenue that we generally gener generated. So um, any, any um, governmental entity does need to work toward having that fund balance. And we did that in Shakopee with our school district. Um, at one point, about 11 years ago, we had a very, very low fund balance. But that board made a commitment to build that fund balance up and so that when things happened, we would be in a good position and not have to make cuts. Mr. Pratt. Well, I agree. We faced the same problem in Prior Lake. I mentioned that we faced a million dollar deficit when I joined the board. We made those cuts and uh, we, we uh, uh, increased our spending slow, at a slower rate than we were growing as a district. And so, you know, I faced very similar types of, of uh, challenges that, that Kathy has. But to say that we're going to go out and raise revenue, raise taxes, and draw those funds out of the private economy doesn't seem like the way to grow the economy to me, especially when we're already among the highest taxed uh, uh, states in the country. Well, as a follow-up on this question of budgeting, should budget shifts be considered a solution to balancing a budget? Ms. Bush, 30 seconds on this topic. I lived that as a school board member, as I know Eric did, and um, I, I don't think it's the answer. No. I don't like to see budget shifts. Mr. Pratt. I don't like to see budget shifts either. They take too long to pay back. What we need to do is, is make tough decisions of sustainable changes. That's, we didn't shift our budgets uh, when we faced our, our problems and went from a million dollar deficit to a three million dollar surplus. Uh, we made sustainable changes that paid off year after year and I think that's got to be the focus. Would both of you be able to give us examples of either a revenue that you would raise or a piece of spending that you would cut? And we'll continue in the order of the original question with Ms. Bush. The spending that we would cut. Hmm. Additional revenue you would raise or a piece of spending you would cut? Um, as I mentioned before, I, I really would like to explore the possibility of the online sales tax. Um, I, I just think uh, it's not fair for the businesses that we have in our state that are uh, storefront businesses. And I think that we're missing out on some good revenue by not having online sales tax. Mr. Pratt? Well, I would agree. I think uh, fairness would say that we should have an online sales tax and not have our, our local uh, companies, Best Buy, Target, as well as uh, uh, small retailers uh, competing against uh, large internet companies that, uh, that have an inherent advantage. Um, and so, but I, I don't see that as necessarily uh, an increase in taxes as much as I do a fairness. What we need to do is start, again, talking about a tax system that is fair, a tax system that promotes growth, and a tax system uh, that uh, gets rid of regressive taxes and helps middle-income families uh, meet the, meet, uh, have middle-class families ends meet. Well, moving back for a few minutes then to social issues, do you believe that undocumented students should receive public funds to help them attend college? Mr. Pratt, we'll begin with you. Uh, no, I don't. Um, while they're here of, by no fault of their own, their parents likely brought them. Uh, undocumented students are a drain on our system today. They're not counted uh, as part of our uh, our, our revenue collection system uh, and um, we need to make sure and we shouldn't be financing their higher education we're already financing their elementary and and, and uh, high school education um, but no I don't support college Ms. Bush do you believe that undocumented students should receive public funds to help them attend college well I think you might be um, referring to something um, like President Obama's dream act that he uh, was recently um, came into being and um, I've known students who have come here as very young children who um, did not come here on their own. They came with their parents, and um, they're most likely going to stay here. And I think we want our society and our workforce to be as educated as possible. Um, I, I do support um, President Obama's initiative, and so, yes, I would be in favor of undocumented students receiving not more, but maybe this, the same opportunity as what is afforded to people who are citizens. 
We'll move then now to the issue of, of transportation. What can be done to raise and four lane the 101 bridge over the Minnesota River? Ms. Bush, we'll begin with you. What can be done to raise the? And four lane the 101 lane? bridge over the Minnesota River. Well, I certainly have been hearing that that's something that people want. Um, it seems to me that um, from what I understand that there could be an expansion that we don't need a separate bridge, but we do need an expansion. Um, it, it really creates a lot of gridlock in this area when um, we have floods, which I know today we're not thinking of after having gone through a drought period, but we had three seasons in a row, spring, fall, spring, where, where the river crossing was closed, and it was definitely a hardship for people. Um, I don't know the specifics of how that gets raised, but I do think that needs to be a priority for this area and that I, I hope that our legislature will look at that. Mr. Pratt, what can be done to raise and four lane the 101 bridge over the Minnesota River? Well, the easy answer is cement and steel, but uh, <laughs> I don't think that's what you're getting at. Um, the MnDOT believes we should have a four lane uh, bridge and raise it up. The, the, the bottleneck here is the Met Council and we need to make sure that the Met Council goes back to an advisory role rather than a regulatory role and get them out of the way so that we can get this bridge done the way the legislature and the Minnesota Department of Transportation believes it should be. Funny, you should mention the Met Council. <laughs> Ms. Bush, we'll give you 30 seconds to respond. I was uh, going to add that I believe there does need to be um, input from our local citizenry, whether through our county, possibly even through our cities. Um, but I think Scott County needs to be a player in that role as well. So. Well, for our next question, we do want to address the Met Council. Do you believe that the structure of the Met Council is appropriate? And if not, how would you change it, Mr. Pratt? I don't believe it's appropriate. Uh, the Met Council started off as an advisory committee that took over operations for uh, transit and sewers and all sorts of uh, uh, operations that used to be handled by cities and counties. Um, we don't have a Scott County representative on the Met Council today, and we need one. We need somebody there representing our views. The Met Council is appointed by the governor. It's not accountable to the voters, and I believe that the Met Council needs to be accountable, either being uh, selected from local uh, officials or standing for countywide election or at-large election. And so those are some of the ideas that, that I, would, I would see. I had the opportunity to be part of a transportation forum just the other night, and I was amazed at the bipartisan support there was for, for re, uh, uh, revamping the Met Council and making it more accountable to the people. Ms. Bush, do you believe that the structure of the Met Council is appropriate, and if not, how would you change it? Yeah, I agree with Mr. Pratt on this, with his answer, and so I'm not gonna repeat it. I completely agree. Well, then we will give you an opportunity now to make a one-minute closing statement, and we'll begin with Ms. Bush. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the Shakopee Chamber of Commerce and the Shakopee School District um, and the high school students who are here and the people involved with kids voting. Um, as I said at the opening, it's wonderful to see so many people who are interested in um, what's going to happen with this election. Um, I have been a part of this community for a long time. Um, you know that I've been on the school board. I've talked about that. But I've also been a very active member of this community. And I think I know and understand many of the people that live in Senate District 55. And I also think I've gained the trust of a lot of those people. I was elected five times to the school board. I've won awards. I was awarded the All-State School Board Award. I also this year received the Shakopee Rotary um, W. Adair Meralt Award for um, exemplary community service. Those things came, I think, because of a long time of being involved in my community, working with others, and trying to make my community and the general area a better place to be. Um, as I also mentioned, I'm, I'm not a real strong party person. I greatly appreciate the endorsement of the DFL, and I am in line with their platform. But I am a person who doesn't vote a straight party ticket. I'm a moderate. I will reach across the aisle. And I think I'm the right person to go to St. Paul and work with other people at this time. I, appreciate, I would greatly appreciate your support, support when you go to vote on November 6th. Thank you. Mr. Pratt. Well, I too want to thank the uh, Shakopee Chamber and the Shakopee Schools for allowing us this opportunity. Um, I, I too have been elected in uh, four terms on the, on the school board and uh, uh, very active in the community. We've been represented well. 
in the state Senate by, by Senator Roebling. And what she's shown us is that leadership and the ability to uh, talk to people makes a difference. Um, my vision is that our leader continues to be a servant, a servant to the people. I'm not going to St. Paul to, with, with any sort of agenda. I'm going to represent the people of Scott County. Um, I believe we have a tremendous opportunity at this point in time to make Minnesota a great, great state, a state with great economic potential, a state where innovation and entrepreneurship uh, thrives, where families come together and people are moving in. And we're not only a leader in agriculture, but we're a leader in, in the new high-tech industries that this, uh, that this millennium is promising to be. That's what I want to see for Minnesota. That's why I believe I should be in St. Paul. And I hope I can earn your vote on November 6th. Thank you. Well, if you still have questions for our candidates this evening, our candidates are here and willing to answer your questions, or please visit their websites or contact their campaigns directly. Again, I would remind everyone that the views expressed this evening are those of the candidates, not those of the Chamber and Visitors Bureau or of the Shakopee Public Schools. Sponsorship of this debate does not represent an endorsement by the Chamber or the schools of any candidate. Thank you to our audience this evening, to our hosts, the Shakopee Public Schools, to the Shakopee Chamber and Visitors Bureau, and thank you as well to all of our candidates for serving our community by participating in the democratic process by running for office. Election Day is approaching quickly. Please remember to vote on Tuesday, November 6th. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>